This conference will now be recorded. All right, folks, very good. So we have here chapter six, uh, the third chapter that we're looking at and reviewing and lecturing on as far as human, bi human uh, biology class. Now, uh, know that, and I want to mention this to you all regarding the Cengage homework, okay? So you may use your, as far as the, the, the testing that you do on Cengage, as far as what you have to, um, to do for me, and I, I put it in the system as far as coursework, you may use your PowerPoints in order to take those quizzes on Cengage, okay? So you may use the, the Cengage PowerPoints, kind of like an open book, but it's not, it's more open PowerPoint, right? That you can take those quizzes on Cengage, all right? So that's, that's acceptable. Because again, I allow for, in my practical exams here in human biology, you can have the, uh, the word bank. And then also for our quizzes, you have, so for the quizzes that I give in class, or for those that are given the quiz on uh, online for, that I create, you will only be able to use one side of a three by five card per chapter. So in the case of um, the first two quizzes, so for chapter four, you'll have a separate uh, card. And for chapter five, you'll have a separate card, okay? Only one side, like I said, with notes for your, uh, for your quiz there, okay? So very good. So let's move on and let's look at as far as chapter six is concerned. So if you recall, if you all recall when we were uh, looking at the tissues and I said to you that there's epithelial tissue, there's connective tissue, we have muscular tissue and we have nervous tissue. So here we're at muscular level. So different types of muscular tissue are skeletal muscle. Again, we contract the muscles that are skeletal muscle and they move the skeleton, simple enough. We have smooth muscle. Smooth muscle, you have no voluntary control. So skeletal muscle, conscious voluntary control. I know, I think about it, I can contract those muscles. Smooth muscle, that's not the case, right? <coughs> Think the uh, musculature of the organs of the body, of the blood vessels of the body, okay? That's when you're thinking of that, that, think of smooth muscle, no conscious control. And then lastly, we're looking at cardiac muscle, okay? So cardiac muscle, muscle of the heart. This is what actually contracts in order to allow for movement of blood through the body. So the heart is two pumps. So the heart, two pumps, and that cardiac muscle contracts, and that's what's able to push the blood to the lungs and push the blood to the rest of the body, okay? Cardiac muscle. Now you'll see there that it says that cardiac muscle is striated and it's involuntary. Skeletal muscle is striated, but it's voluntary. And smooth muscle is involuntary, but there's no striations. So when we think smooth muscle, we think spindle shaped, that's the nucleus, spindle shaped muscle fibers. In the case of skeletal muscle, we think of, let's, let's take a look over at a muscle over here. So let's look at the arm. Let's simple it up. So as we're looking at this arm, we look at bicep brachialis because we all know bicep muscle, right? Well, if you look at this muscle, as long as that muscle is, that's how long those muscle fibers are. Okay. So as long as the muscle belly, the whole muscle belly, that's how long the muscle fibers. So they're long fibers, so they can be. Okay. Long fibers. They're kind of like stacked upon each other when you look at them under the microscope, okay? Long fibers, they're striated. Cardiac muscle, shorter fibers, and they're branching. There's actually branching that's taking place. A little bit of a different presentation, okay? But skeletal muscle, long muscle fibers. All right, let's move on. So here you're seeing the uh, presentation as far as the image. You'll see there that you have those long muscle fibers for skeletal muscle. 
the smooth muscle fibers, which are spindle shaped, they're kind of long, they're kind of an odd shaped muscle, and then the branching of the cardiac muscle. And here, this is a very good image that will help you, and I'll provide other images for you in documents and resources regarding the musculature that you'll need to know. Go ahead, please. I don't mean for you to go back, but no, no, it's okay. Can you explain um, triated backwards? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Let Let's do that. So I'm gonna th thank you for pointing that out, because it's an odd word to be honest. Because you're like, well, what does that mean, striated? I'm going to pull up, <coughs> here we go. This is a slide, a slide of an image of skeletal muscle. Do you see how their fibers are on top of each other? Do you see also that there are lines? You see those lines? Those are striations. Those striations are present because we're going to see later on today in the PowerPoint as a result of certain um, proteins present in skeletal muscle that, that make up the skeletal muscle that overlap or don't and that's what creates those lines present within there. So cardiac muscle also has that. Okay. The proteins you say. Are there are proteins, yes, there are specific proteins and we'll look at them a little bit later on in the PowerPoint. And let's go to so this again, this is a very good and helpful image. And like I said, I'll provide other images for you. So when we have our lab quiz, you'll be able to uh, recall this. And it just helps you to get a good idea as far as some the major muscles of the human body. Okay? So you're not looking at a whole lot of deep muscles, but you're looking at more of the superficial muscles. And, and you all have an idea regarding, you've heard of the quadriceps, you've heard of the hamstrings, right? That's what comprises the quadriceps is comprised of four muscles, the hamstrings, and the posterior aspect of your thigh, three muscles. You've all heard of the gluteus maximus, I'm sure, the glutes, right? You've heard of the abs, right? So rectus abdominis, that's what gives that appearance of that uh, washboard appearance, right? Um, that's that muscle right there. Um, look, the lats, your lats, the latissimus dorsi, very big muscle. Your traps, you see how that muscle quite a large uh, muscle and very important as far as for your uh, neck range of motion and mobility and strength, and the movement of the shoulders. Um, and then upper and lower extremities. So I'll go over in lab, not this week, right? But next week we'll, we'll go over as far as uh, we'll review skeleton and we'll look again at uh, muscle, okay? So that you have an idea. And then I have a list for you of for lab quiz number one, and I've posted this in documents and resources for those online as well as those in class, right? Um, that list so that you can study that list and study those uh, particular structures so that when it comes time for the lab quiz and you have your word bank, you'll say, oh, I recognize that. That's such and such. Okay? So I'm trying to do all that I can to uh, provide you with, you know, enough information, enough helps to do well. I do love this drink. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Have you guys ever tried this? Bye. It's excellent. It's really. And then, so I'm drinking this and drinking this, right? And then uh, one of our my friends goes, uh, she said, Have you read the back of the label? I'm like, Yeah, it's got low calories. It's good. I mean, and she said, Yeah, it's got caffeine in it also. <laughs> so I was wondering why I was feeling a little jacked after I'm drinking, like, powering a bunch of these potty drinks. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> this right here, I like this image. And I think this is the one that I made larger for you on your PowerPoint for those in class here. Look on the back, folks. So I made it larger so it's easier for you to see. And you'll see here that I, I like that it gives you an actual um, explanation of what we would say would be the action of a muscle. So again, let's let's go back over by our upper extremity over here in the lab. Okay. So this is 
isn't an easy one, but I want you to think and remember that no matter what the muscle is, if it's a skeletal muscle, and when we have what's called an isotonic type of contraction, when this muscle contracts and it shortens, what is it doing? It's moving something. It's moving the skeleton, like I've said multiple times. So know that no matter where you're looking at, whether it's the upper, the lower extremity, the whole uh, body, looking at an image like that, if you see the image and go, okay, well, here's the muscle, and if it shortens, what's it going to do? What bones are it going to pull closer together? So that you can figure out, as a result of that, you can figure out the action of the muscle. And so it's nice here in this image that we've provided for you all that you can actually see the action of and read the action of each of these muscles as you're seeing them here. And I think that can be quite helpful. Right? And so I hope that uh, you are able to uh, appreciate that, uh, looking at that and reviewing that. So you'll see here that the structure and function of skeletal muscles. So as we move throughout the semester, it's really important that you, so this human biology class, it's like an overview of the human body. And so you are able to, as a result of doing this coursework for this class, you're seeing the structure of each of the organ systems. So recall we talked about those 11 organ systems. So muscular, skeletal, right? cardiovascular, urinary, respiratory, lymphatic, integumentary, the skin, right? Then we looked at the, we're, talk, we're going to be looking at the nervous system, the endocrine system, the reproductive system, and the digestive system. So all of those systems, there's a certain parts of, there's structure, there's organs, there's parts, and then how do those parts function? How do they work? The physiology, how do they function and work together to uh, maintain the function of the human body? And so with each system that we go over and do and, and review, you'll have to know the structures, you'll have to know the function of these, the basic functions of each of those systems. And, and really understand that um, as people who might not be going into the medical field, but some of you might, as far as like in uh, psychology, sociology, whatever, you're still working with people, right? And, and having a good working understanding of how the human body functions and works, that's very important. I really believe that that's important for us all to have some understanding of that. Today, I went to the, uh, I've been going for the past couple of weeks now, um, trying to uh, work on my blood pressure and my blood pressure medications being adjusted. And we're trying to figure out what to do and how to do things so that it's uh, maintained and under control. Uh, genetically, my mom and her side of the family, so my maternal, my maternal side of the family, suffers with high blood pressure. And so, it's been something I, I've dealt with over the years, but it's been managed, but now it's at a point where there's some issues, so we're trying to manage it better. Uh, so as such, it's been, been quite interesting to, you know, put a focus more on for myself as far as what's going on with my health and, and in particular my cardiovascular system. So now it's not crazy high, thank God, but it's still at a number that, you know, needs to be lower. So that's what we're trying to do. And so uh, having an understanding of for your own personal self what's going on with your own body or your family members' bodies, as far as their health and such. Um, this is something I hope that you all appreciate after the class is done, okay? So coming back to the muscular system, understanding that when muscles produce, how muscles produce force by contracting, right? Depending upon the load. Now, now listen to this for a moment. It sounds kind of weird, right? But when, I, when I'm talking about load, I mean like the mass and the weight of something. So whether I'm picking up this by drink, drinking it, right? Or I'm picking up this little marker pen, right? You understand that same action that I did to pick them up and to move them off of the table and bring them closer to the screen here, but the muscles that were working together to do that not as many muscle fibers present. So the same muscles can be doing the job, but not as many muscle fibers. So let's go back over to our model here. And as we're looking at this model, so look at, with this, again, with this biceps, you know, you all kind of grasp, 
So if you see that there's a lot of muscle fibers, we would also call them muscle cells. Okay, so the long muscle fibers, they're also known as muscle cells. Note that not all of the muscle fibers have to be working really hard in order to pick up something. So yes, there's going to be contraction of the musculature, right? But if it's a light load, not as many of the muscle fibers will pick up will be really working hard. Whereas if that's a heavy thing, you know, like you lifted heavy things, right? I told my wife at 57, I'm done lifting heavy things. <laughs> if, if we ever move again, there's definitely going to be movers involved. There's not going to be any family members involved. I'm just done lifting heavy stuff. Now, back in the day, from 13 in my 20s, actively involved in weightlifting. You know, so. And I enjoy it, I love it, right? And now I exercise, but I don't. <laughs> it's just because I have to, not because I want to. But back in the day, I exercised because I loved it and I enjoyed doing it. And lifting heavy things, man, you, you do. And there were times, how many of you have lifted something? Well, how many of you have tried to lift something that was very heavy and, man, you maybe clutched it a little bit or just not at all? Have you ever done that? Right? And, and you really felt like the strain on the muscles as you're doing that, right? Pretty interesting. And so we would say that that's a load. And so most often times, by contracting however many muscle fibers, right, we can overcome the load and pick it up. Okay? I, I'm fascinated. Uh, I, I, for years, I followed uh, um, martial arts, but also uh, powerlifting. If you've seen some of these powerlifters lift weights that you're just like, holy cow, or like strongman competitions, Cool stuff, you know, really, I don't know, it's not interesting. And to be able to train the human body to lift weights and lift lift a weight, no matter what that is, whether it's the back of the car or whatever it may be, weights and, and mass that just like for the majority of people in the world cannot have any stretch of the imagination to be able to lift or to move in any way. So the musculature is remarkable in what it's able to do. There's two terms here. And well, let me come up to these two terms first. Relaxation and, le and lengthening. So when there's contraction that takes place, when you normally think of, there's, there's really two types of muscle contraction. We're going to talk about something called isotonic contraction. Isotonic contraction, okay? So isotonic contraction, when you think of your skeletal muscle and I want to move something and I think voluntarily I want to move it, that's an isotonic contraction, meaning that the muscle belly shortens, okay? But, but know this, that there is an isometric contraction, isometric contraction, you can, so how about the abdominal, rectus abdominis, right? You can, so if you put your hand, so do this for me if you don't mind, right here in class, right? Put your hand, and you can do this at home also, right? put your hand on the upper aspect of your abdominal muscles. Now just don't do a crunch, don't do a crunch, but just sit there or stand and tighten those muscles underneath your hand. You can feel it tight, can you not, right? Have you shortened the muscles at all? really have it, right? What you've done is you've done an isometric contraction. You've not done an isotonic contraction, okay? And so contraction, those muscle fibers will tighten and depending upon the contraction, they'll shorten. And then when you stop, they'll relax, okay? So there's contraction and relaxation with musculature. Interesting, there's also antagonistic muscles and synergistic muscles. So another time back at our arm here, and what you're looking at, when you're looking at this upper extremity, is that there can be multiple muscles that do this, that provide this action. Those muscles, right, so the bicep brachialis, but here's also the brachialis, the coracle brachialis, right? Work to contribute to action, 
right? Similar type action, cortical brachialis might cause, but brachialis and break and biceps brachialis. We would say that they are synergistic. They work together, synergistic. If they work opposite, so look at this. Bicep brachii, what's this one back here? Triceps brachii. So biceps and triceps, they have an antagonistic relationship. So in other words, one does this action, one does this action. Flexion, extension. Do you understand those are antagonistic actions? So the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii are antagonistic muscles. Understood? Opposite actions. So when we're talking about musculature, we need to keep that in mind that there are synergistic muscles and there are antagonistic muscles. Now the structure of muscle. So you'll see here that, and we'll see an image in just a moment there. But you're seeing here that it says here, bundles of muscle fibers contain myofibrils. Okay. So when you see those muscle fibers, what did I say they were also known as? Muscle cells. So muscle fiber equals a muscle cell. Right? Same thing, AKA, AKA also known as. So the muscle fibers, muscle cells are containing these myofibrils. There's these packages, right? It's kind of like, have you ever, let's see. Okay. So we have here a bunch of pencils. They're a bunch of wax pencils. Okay? And they use some microbiology, so I'm going to wash my hands after I'm touching these things. That's so. So imagine, imagine this is a muscle. All of these pencils, the whole thing would be a muscle. And the pencils each represent a muscle fiber, okay? So they each represent a muscle fiber. Now, each of those muscle fibers, think about this, are made up of myofibrils, which are just like this, okay? So there's kind of like packages and packages and packages of cylindrical structures. Okay, cylindrical structures. And so muscles are made up of these myofibrils. And you'll see here that that term sarcomere, it's really the unit of contraction of these even smaller structures called myofilaments. Myofilaments. These myofilaments are actin and myosin. Actin and myosin. And actin, thin myofilaments, myosin, thick myofilaments. These structures are microscopic and they contribute to the contraction of skeletal muscle. Okay. The myofilaments they make up the sacrum. Yeah, so the sarcomere is made up of these myofilaments. Yes, indeed. And the crossing over and the, the overlapping of these myofilaments allows for that striation that we saw earlier in skeletal muscle, as well as in uh, cardiac muscle. Now, also we want to look at the term tendon. And remember that I said to you that a tendon connects, anchors a skeletal muscle to a bone. So muscle isn't just by itself, right? It has uh, this connective tissue extension that anchors it to bone so that when muscle contracts, these very strong tendons holding onto the bone will pull the bone in whatever direction the contraction of the muscle goes. It's pretty wild stuff. So you'll see also here that the term bursa. Bursa are these fluid-filled sacs that allow for 
the soft tissue to move for the joints and so that there's free flow movement in the joints. Okay? So a common bursa that people will have an inflammation of, a bursitis. How many of you have heard the term bursitis? You might have heard that, or you might have had somebody say, oh, I've got bursitis. Well, what does that mean? It just means that these fluid-filled sacs get inflamed, they get irritated. And so that can be the elbow, that could be the shoulder, that could be the knee, that could be the hip. There are multiple areas where the bursa can become inflamed and irritated. Here you're seeing as far as tendons, anchoring muscle to bone, and allowing for, and really there's multiple soft tissue structures here present at the joint in order to allow for these joints to move, right? So you know, you can, you can, you can contract musculature and you can move these muscles, right? Which, act, which actually will, contract the muscles, move the joints, move the bones, and they move at these pivot joints, these um, areas of where bone and bone come together. And they're, and remember this also, what did, we, what did we talk about last week as far as the bones? Ligaments connect bone to bone. Muscle is connected to bone via the tendons. So a ligament anchors, connects bone to bone, tendons anchor muscle to bone. Now, you're going to also see here interesting uh, terms here as far as origin and insertion. So these terms, how, how many of you, if you've done any type of uh, weightlifting and such, have you heard of these terms before at all? Anybody? Origin and insertion? Maybe not, but here, here's the thing. Read, let's read what, the, what it says here. On one end of a muscle, called the origin, it stays relatively motionless or doesn't move. It's more of like the anchor. But then the insertion, the other end of the muscle that's anchoring to the bone by the tendon, attaches to the bone that moves. Okay? So again, think about your shoulder right, and your elbow. So when biceps brachii contracts, is it doing this? No, it's just doing this. Okay? So anchored here, origin, insertion here on the forearm to allow the forearm to move. Do you understand? So origin is really not moving, but the insertion where the muscle is inserting, that actually moves. Okay? So if you're, if you're thinking of a lower leg, right? Contracting the quadriceps, contracting the quadriceps, you're moving that lower leg, okay? So the, the uh, femur and such, the thigh, it's not moving. Only the lower leg is moving when those quadriceps or doing the opposite action, right? Right, hamstrings, they're moving the leg in more of a flexion. Quadriceps, more of an extension of the lower leg, right? So again, just as a review. So those are, so those are two actions also when we're thinking of when we're thinking of quadriceps, extension, flexion, hamstrings, quadriceps, hamstrings, right? Antagonistic muscle actions. And knowing that the thigh not moving, but the lower leg, the tibia, the fibula, they're moving. Those are the areas that are the insertion, the origin, stabilized, not moving. It's kind of a little bit of a weird thing, but it's important to know, in addition to what goes on as far as uh, action of muscles are concerned. Okay? You'll see here, when muscle contracts, it pulls on the bone to which it is attached, and again, causing that movement. And here's just giving you an image regarding the antagonistic relationship between biceps brachii and triceps brachii. Flexion, extension, right, of the uh, forearm.
Now, we'll go a few more minutes and we'll take a break. Okay. Why don't you stand up for a moment? Stand up, do a little stretch. Uh, Seventh inning stretch. Anybody like baseball? <laughs> I love baseball. So, yeah, stretch it out a little bit just so you don't fall asleep. It's hard. You know, after after lunch and such, it's uh, it can be a little bit of a slog, so we have to just stay awake. So there are there are slow twitch and fast twitch muscles, right? That are that are fast twitch no fibers. Sorry, slow twitch and fast twitch fibers that are present in muscle. Now genetically. Some have more of one than the other. Have you ever know, know, noticed uh, when, you, when you're doing different types of uh, at school and sports or whatever, or being actively involved in some type of uh, track and field or football or soccer or um, field hockey or whatever it may be, right? Swimming. Some people can swim a long time, just naturally. Now, training can improve, improve this, right? Absolutely. But just naturally, some kids, some young people, right, they can swim for a long time and not seem to get tired. And then some people can swim real fast, but they kind of tire out quicker. Well, depending upon genetically, your genetic makeup of your musculature, if you have more slow twitch or fast twitch muscles, uh, fibers present in your muscles, you can be genetically predisposed to be more of a faster runner or more of a long distance runner. Like I said, though, we can train to improve this, okay? There's this guy, a, a, a Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL. Um, I think his name is Michael Goggins. He's, like, incredible. This dude does, like, ultra marathons. I mean, like, over 100 miles marathons. <laughs> He's like, what? How can someone run out? And so it's not so much that they're, like, sprinting, you know, for 100 miles. That's ridiculous, right? But, but they can they can run, jog, 100 miles or more. Incredible, right? It's like, how do they do these things? And just some people, and, and his was training and mental determination. But again, too, know that, you know, genetically, some can have more of this ability than others, but training does play a part in this. So let's look at these for a moment here. So you'll see that slow twitch, kind of just like what it says. It says contract slowly. Contraction can be stained, sustained over a long time, slow twitch. Fast twitch can contract rapidly and powerfully for short periods, but can't see it sustain a long contraction. So interesting, right? So you have these slow and these fast twitch fibers. And so you're seeing that in musculature, we all have a combination of these, but again, genetically, some have more of one than the other, and they're able to do more distance type things or more short distance type things. So it all depends as far as endurance level, like high endurance or low endurance naturally. And then again, like I said, training can definitely improve this dramatically. So how muscles contract? Now, this is kind of, I have to tell you that this is a very, um, it's kind of odd to be honest, a little strange, right? But know this that, I'll just give you this for now, and then we'll go into it, but you see where I give you the actin and the myosin, right? Those two thin and thick. So, and this is how you remember this also. Actin, actin, right? Actin, thin, that's thin my myofilaments. The myosin, opposite, it's thick myofilaments, right? Here's the deal. Myosin and actin, when they touch, when they touch, when they touch, remember this. Remember, you, you contract the mus muscles in your abdomen, but you don't crunch, you don't shorten them, you don't do the isotonic, which you normally think of isotonic. You're thinking of, we think of isometric. Actin and myosin, they connect. This is, a, this is called an isometric contraction. They touch, and there's tightening of the musculature. When 
myosin touches and then starts moving, sliding actin upon myosin. And then, again, it's a weird kind of a thing, right? But this actin myofilament slides. And when it does this, that's when your muscle belly gets shortened, right? That's when your muscle belly gets shortened. That's the isotonic contraction, okay? So it's kind of like I said, like it's kind of weird. It's <laughs> not going to lie. You know, it's a little bit amazing that at the microscopic level and the, and the scientists being able to, to determine that this is what takes place. It's pretty amazing. And the unit of this contraction is called the sarcomere. So the unit of this contraction is called the sarcomere. And it has these thick and thin myofilaments, these thick myosin, these thin actin. And one key thing, please write down for me. So please write down in your notes. The actin myofilament slides upon myosin. The actin myofilament slides upon actin. The actin myofilament slides upon myosin. I'm just going to look at this next slide and then we're going to take a break. Again, it's a lot of kind of heavy, so I want to give you a little chill time for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and we'll resume. So what you're seeing here, folks, is that here we have a muscle over here on the left that's been cross-section, right? You can see that it's made up of these different filaments, of different myofibrils, these different structures that we break down. They're, they're packages, packages of cylindrical structures. So we get to the point where there are these sarcomeres composed of these, you'll see the little dots there, of these actin and myosin. And myosin has like these like, like golf clubs. They're like a golf club. And the head of that golf club actually touches those little balls right here, those little actin myofilaments. It's comprised of those little structures, okay? And you're not always having those little structures exposed so that they can have a connection between the myosin and the actin, or else this is what would happen with you. I'm like, well, like tight, because all my muscles, because there's never been a relaxation. You have to have relaxation, right? To some extent. Now realize that as you're all in my classroom here, as well as you all at home, you're sitting upright. You, you, uh, well, those at home, you might be laying down. I don't know. I can't see you. But <laughs> here in the classroom, we're, we're upright. We're sitting. We're upright. I'm standing. And we have a, a portion of our musculature, our postural muscles, right? Posture, right? Good posture, bad posture. Right? We have our postural muscles in some state of contraction, but not full contraction, to allow for you to be sitting upright. Okay? If you weren't, you'd be on the ground, just laying on the ground, right? So there's some type of contraction. It's not that it's at full, all muscle fibers contracting, no, but there are, now there are disorders, there are illnesses where patients will have certain levels of extended contracture of musculature, and that's really uncomfortable, very painful, it can be, and really debilitating as far as limiting your ability to, to move and get around. So that's the key as far as with this slide right here showing you where at really this microscopic level, when we look at the muscle and we break it down into its individual parts, that at that microscopic level, we have this actin and myosin. And myosin has the club heads. The club heads connect with, when they're allowed to, actin, and they'll cause a contraction and isometric. And then when they start sliding, actin is sliding on myosin, then we have this ability to have um, contraction, this isotonic contraction. All right, gang, take 10. So those in the uh, studio audience, 
Those at, at home, uh, take 10 minutes, and we'll start at uh, we'll start at 3:10. So give you like 12 minutes. So, so 3:10, I will start promptly for you all. Those of you that are um, watching online, if you have any questions, again, please make sure that you post in the chat box, and I can address them for you. If not, send me an email. And again, to know that I'm going to be um, I'm recording this session, so we'll I'll post this in uh, YouTube after a day or so. All right, very good. So 10 minutes, I'm going to shut off the uh, microphone uh, for the classroom here right now.
Okay, folks, so we're going to continue on. Okay. <clears throat> And we'll go a little bit, we'll take another short break, like a five minute break, and then we'll finish up. So we'll just break it up into two parts, the last remaining uh, portion of our uh, PowerPoints, okay? So, with contraction, we said that contraction actually allows for the muscles to do a job, have some type of action, and then relaxation is important. So contraction and relaxation. Right? Well, what happens when a patient who is dead, a person who is dead, right? What happens to their musculature? They become kind of there's there's a contraction that takes place. There's not a relaxation. We call this rigor mortis, right? Rigor mortis. What's going on, folks, is that the musculature for a period of time sustains a keeps a prolonged contraction of the musculature. And you, you know this term because you've heard, like if you've ever watched a movie and they say, you know, it's stiff, they refer to a dead body as a stiff, because of the fact that their musculature has contracted and it's not relaxed and it's a dead body. And you could even hear stories of um, contracture of musculature of the body where it could cause uh, a movement of a joint or like of the upper torso where the kind of the corpse sits up a little bit kind of crazy stuff right but these things can happen it's not voluntary it's involuntary and what's going on folks is that no more ATP is being produced so you say to yourself well, what's ATP I, I've mentioned this before but I want to tell you that ATP is the energy that the body will use in order to power reactions that take place within the body. And it's important for, remember I said to you that myosin and actin, they connect, right? They connect and then they can cause movement, sliding of actin upon myosin. They can't re release, this actin and myosin can't release if there's no ATP present. Now, know this for this class, you're not gonna have to know all that goes on, all the steps. No, you're not going to have to know that. I want you to just know some basics as far as what's going on with muscle contraction. Understood? Okay. So, so know that I'm not going to ask you all the different steps. I'm not going to require a lot of detailed information regarding muscle contraction. But know this, that ATP is important to allow for the, the actin and myosin to separate and allow for relaxation to occur. So ATP is important for that. And know that calcium is an important role. So look at our skeleton in the back, folks. That skeleton in the back, if that were live, right, and, and, and you know, of a patient, right, that would contain a lot of calcium, okay? A lot of calcium would be present in the live, so, you know, in, in, the, in the body, in our bodies right now, you're looking around, our skeletal system contains a lot of calcium, and think of it like the bank. So you go to the bank, and you take a withdrawal of money, right? Hopefully you have it there. You can take the withdrawal. Our bodies have calcium stored, like in a bank. Calcium is stored in that bank of the skeletal system in order that when we need it, we can take from it and we can have that calcium to allow for our nervous system to function and allow for our muscular system, like your, your cardiovascular also. All for these muscles to do their job, calcium is integral a very important part of that ability to do that. So actin slides over myosin. I said that before. We know that. Myosin is stationary. Okay, that makes sense, right? Because imagine, have you ever um, been on roller skates or on ice skates and you're trying to move something or it's really hard because you're like your, your feet are moving and yet you're trying to, to, to pull on something or move something. It's pretty difficult. But if I'm like, so if we do, um, if we're doing a tug of war, so I, I brace myself, right? I get into a lower stance, I'm bracing myself and, and I'm able to really like hold off against somebody pulling on the rope on the other end, right? But if I had roller skates and I'm trying to brace myself, they're just gonna pull me around. It wouldn't make any sense. So you need to be stationary. So myosin is stationary 
it's actin that's sliding, that's moving. Okay? That's important for you to know. So knowing about the movement of actin upon myosin, rigor mortis, it's a lack of. So oh, getting back to rigor mortis. So I said to you that ATP allows for the myosin and the actin to separate, and which would allow for relaxation to occur. If it's a dead body, is it going to be producing any ATP? No, right? Because it's dead. So there's no there's no processes like that meta metabolic processes going on. So as such, look at this. It can last from 24 to 60 hours. That's a pretty long time, actually, right? And and here you go as far as you're seeing that the ATP is present and it allow for the separation once the ATP connects with that myosin head. Again, like I said, it looks like a golf club. When it connects with that myosin head, it allows for then there to be a separation between the myosin and the active. So a separation between the myosin and the active. Separation, ATP has to be present. Now, what's going on here also is that there's, there's, I said to you that calcium is important. So calcium is stored in the skeletal system. It's also stored in something called the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, okay? Now, do you recall before I said to you that the actin and the myosin, they're not always connecting because the actin can be covered. It can be covered and prevented from the myosin connecting with it. There's a structure that's doing that. But this structure will move away when calcium is present. So this is why calcium is important. Okay? It's important in two parts, and I'm going to show you the other part in a moment there. But know that the nerve that allows for muscles to contract, the nerve that sends electricity to the muscles so that they can do their job, that's called a motor neuron, right? Motor, meaning it's going to provide some type of movement and such. So motor neuron, signals trigger or stop contraction of the sarcomere. So that sarcomere is that contractile unit. Calcium is stored in this sarcoplasmic reticulum. And here are the two structures that prevent myosin from touching actin all the time. If they weren't, if troponin and tropomyosin weren't present and weren't blocking actin, remember actin? Actin's that thin one with the little balls. If actin were always exposed, myosin would be connecting, 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 and there'd just be like this constant contracture going on. That wouldn't be healthy or good. So troponin and tropomyosin are there to prevent continual contraction. And what will move them away to allow for myosin to touch actin is calcium. So you see calcium is important. Calcium moves tropomyosin in particular out of the way, and it allows for then myosin to touch, to connect with actin and allow for contraction, whether it's the, what we've said here, isometric or isotonic, right? Calcium needs to be present in order for this to happen. Okay? So that's why calcium is more than just good for your bones. Calcium is important for your nervous system to allow for there to be connections between the nervous system and allow for also muscles to contract. So calcium, very, very important. And here you're just seeing an example in this image here. It's just showing you how the nerves that are coming off of your spine at all the different levels. And, and I want to give you this. I want to get a model. Give me one moment, folks. On, online, give me one moment. Be right back. I'm going to step in the other room for a moment, and I want to get this model to show you.
So those of you that are online, I'm going to share with you an image. And those of you in the classroom, I'm going to show you this model. So give me a moment to get this image for you all. All right, so I'm not trying to sell you a model, but it can be, can make that bigger? Um, okay. But what you're seeing with this model, those of you that are online, and those of you that can see it here, and they can also, those of you that are here in the classroom, you can see how we have a spine with all these yellow structures. These yellow structures are the spinal nerves, okay? So you're seeing those spinal nerves on that image on the board there on the uh, computer and here in the classroom this is what I'm showing as far as this model of the spine with its yellow represented spinal nerves okay and so we know that those nerves go to the musculature of the of the whole body right as well as depending upon where they're located in the spine and also to the organs and the, so they're very important structures all throughout the body that are controlled by these spinal nerves okay so now let's go back to our powerpoint so when we see the so when we see that term that motor neuron it just means that it's a portion of that spinal nerve that's coming off and branching going to specific musculature so you see how we have these axons these extended portions of the nerve that are going to each one of those muscle fibers okay very important okay so very important that they're they're there and they're going to be sending signals from the nervous system traveling along the spinal cord down the motor neuron the endings of the motor neuron terminate they end in next to these muscle cells now know this that they don't touch so the spinal nerves don't touch the muscle there's a space there's a gap okay this gap is going to allow for chemicals to go from the spinal nerve to the muscles themselves those chemicals will then allow for changes to take place and lead to muscles to those myofilaments to connect and then to cause sliding to take place. Again, I'm not asking you for all this information, but I just want you to know some of the basics of what's going on, how muscles actually contract. And you'll see here that, look at this here. So calcium can be released. It interacts with these blue dots right here. That's called troponin. The green line is called tropomyosin. When troponin and calcium they, they connect, they interact, there's receptors for them. It'll cause it to move, change shape, and it'll move that green line out of the way and allow for myosin to connect with actin and then eventually allow for then sliding of actin upon myosin. Pretty wild stuff, right? It's weird, but it's, it's, it's incredible that this is what occurs and how important calcium is and then again, ATP in order for relaxation to occur. So here is that spot so that is said to you that the yellow, this represents the nerve. So here's the nerve. Here the red is the muscle. Okay, and so again, there's that blue little dots, that's the chemical. Have you ever heard of serotonin or dopamine? You probably have heard of those, right? Those are, those are nerve chemicals, they're called neurotransmitters. 
Well, those chemicals present in the brain, right? They're, they're nerve chemicals that are important. Well, here in the muscle, at the muscular level, with the nerve muscle, we call this the neuromuscular junction. It's the nerve muscle junction where they come together. Again, they don't touch. There's a space. That blue is called acetylcholine. That acetylcholine, that neurotransmitter, is what then reaches out to the muscular system, to the muscle fiber, and causes changes where we'll end up having an electrical impulse travel along the, mu the uh, muscle fiber and allow for stages to take place for calcium to be released and muscle contraction to occur. Again, like I said, it's pretty intense, and I'm not asking you to, again, know all this information, but to some degree. Okay. What's the speed that these things are happening? Yeah, I'm, well, how about this? So what's the speed that this happening? So I'm thinking about it, and I'm doing this. I'm thinking, and I'm doing this right away. How about, have, has anybody ever touched something really hot? And does your hand stay on that hot thing? It doesn't. What happens? Reflex. The withdrawal reflex. That fast. So muscle uh, fibers, as far as the really what are called myelinated, they're very insulated. So you see those cables right there, and they're insulated. They have like covering on them. Well, in your nervous system, you have nerves that are covered and uncovered, right, so to speak. And they're, they're insulated with what's called myelin. You've all heard of multiple sclerosis, right? You've heard of MS. And know that it's a demyelinating disorder, meaning that it ruins the covering of the nerves. So if it ruins the covering of the nerves, it, it affects the transmission of the nerve. So they end up having issues with paresthesia, numbness and tingling, and, and weakness in their musculature, issues with their eyesight. These are not good things, okay? Um, but what goes on then, and you know what, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> oh my God. So say again when we're crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, I was just saying the speed. Yes, so the speed, yes. This is what. So that myelin, right? That myelin, that insulator, that allows for quicker speed of transmission. So a myelinated fiber can send it what's called an electrical signal, an action potential it's called. It can send it at 100 meters per second. How many are 100 meters? How many feet? It's like 300 feet, right? So 300 feet in a second. That's how fast it travels. So your answer, yeah, pretty fast. <laughs> and, you know, okay? because I'm just thinking, like even now, like moving my hands, all this like injuries. No. So imagine all of this crazy like contraction is going on when we're just doing all this. We're not even thinking about it, right? It's amazing. Yeah. And and notice that uh, folks that uh, have uh, can't can't see the disease, see, um, leprosy. You, you've all heard of that, right? I think I might have even mentioned that first class. Did I say that? Yeah, because I talked about um, the armadillos. Well, it, it affects the nervous system, and what will happen with that is that um, it affects the nervous system so that it damages your ability to feel things, to receive information. And so what will happen is that a person can touch something hot, and they wouldn't even realize it was hot or if it was sharp. And so they could really damage their skin, and they end up having all kinds of damaging effects to their fingers, their nose, their face, their their feet. So tragic, tragic illness. But again, bacterial infection, so we can treat it with an antibiotic. It takes many times it takes many months to treat it, but we can still treat it. So that's a good thing. Now, we're going to review this when we're in the nervous system. Okay, that's coming up. But, but you'll see here that an axon is just that, that thin, remember you saw that thin yellow line going from the, the nervous system to the muscle? That was the extension of the, uh, the, the nerve, the neuron, okay? And so that's called an axon, okay? That sends out information. That sends out electricity to the muscles so they can do what they can do, okay? This area here called the synapse, that's just the area where you have the nerve and the muscle connecting, but they don't touch, but they're connecting because chemicals can be released. That's called the synapse, and it's called the neuromuscular junction, the nerve muscle junction, or the muscle. 
That neurotransmitter or that nerve chemical, that's like serotonin, dopamine. They're chemicals, nerve chemicals. Acetylcholine, that's for the muscles to do what they do. Let's see here. Let's talk about this term right here, muscle fatigue. So we all know about muscle fatigue, right? So when, when I think of muscle fatigue, I think of um, being in the Coast Guard. I was in boot camp, um, 17 years old in boot camp. That was like insane. And we did eight weeks and was in Cape May, New Jersey. So everybody knows Cape May Wildwood. Oh, it's so pretty. But when I think of Cape May, I don't think of pleasant times, to be honest. Think of being in the sand and being doing push-ups and <laughs> feel like I'm going to get killed by my drill instructor. It's really it involved drill instructor. It's different for the Coast Guard, but um, but fatigue. So I remember being in the sub. So I went to boot camp in the summer. So we all know the beach in the summer is hot, right? Imagine wearing a short sleeve shirt, long pants, and you're in you know military boots and you're hiking. You're you're doing activities. You're doing physical training and it's just kind of crazy. And I remember that one time that um, our, our company, a group of our you know sea sailors got in trouble, right? And it wasn't really like trouble. It was just like they wanted to give you a hard time. So they said you're in trouble. And at the end of the day, at around 7.30, they brought us down to the bottom floor of our barracks, which is like a very uh, narrow and long roof. They closed all the windows and they had us doing exercising for like an hour. Push ups, sit ups, jumping jacks, push ups, sit ups, jumping jacks, whatever. And we're just doing this in this hot room. So imagine a hot room, no air, no airflow, everybody's sweating. <laughs> and it just gets like extremely hot and your, your muscles are just like, I can't do another push up. That's when I think of fatigue, right? Have you ever been to that place where you, you're exercising, you just feel like, I can't do another lap, or I can't do another whatever it may be, another rep, right? Um, fatigue, it's a very real thing. Now, know that there's also folks that um, have something called chronic fatigue, where they actually have, where their, their bodies are just, they're tired all the time. I mean, like, really tired. Like, it's hard for them to just do the basic activities of daily living, like cook a meal wash a dish, walk around the house so much. That, that's a very real issue and can be really uh, quite devastating for people. So chronic fatigue is a very real um, illness that people will suffer from. Um, but we're talking about here more like just like muscle fatigue. And so results of cells need more ATP than is available. So I said to you that that ATP is important in bulk calcium, ATP, all involved in the whole muscle contraction. If we've exercised so much that we've actually depleted a lot of the ATP, that's genuine muscle fatigue, where you just feel like, I can't do another thing. I got to just lay down and rest. Muscle fatigue. All right. So muscles can contract weakly or strongly. We talked about that already. I, I, I addressed that issue with you all. Um, depends upon the number of muscle fibers that receive the signal, right? So I said to you that whether we're lifting a very light object, lifting a very light object, or more of a heavier object, right? Depending upon the load, really depends upon the number of muscle fibers that receive that signal. And you know that that's what can affect. Here's something interesting. You might want to try this at home. Lift something heavy a couple of times up and down. Then go to lift something light in the same action. It's a weird kind of a thing. Yeah, because um, you're used to lifting the heavy thing. Then all of a sudden you go to the light thing, light object, and your your body will kind of get a little confused shortly. And it'll still lift as if you're lifting the heavy and you're only lifting the light. It's kind of interesting. This term tetanus can be as a result of an infection, folks, that can, um, a tetanus, so the term tetanus is not the infection. But you, when you hear the term tetanus, you think of the infection, okay? But 
you see here this term tendon is sustained contraction three to four times the force of a muscle twitch. We've all had a twitch. Have you all had like a little twitch in your eye or a twitch in a muscle? And it's just like a very quick little contraction, bleeding, kind of comes and goes, that's it. Tetanus, it's a little bit more of a sustained contraction. And as a result of, and as a result of a bacterial infection, I want to skip for a moment here and then I'll come back. So we're at 32, so we'll come back to 32. Here we go. So here we're looking at a bacterial infection. And this, 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 that image there, that painting, is a very famous painting of a, of a gentleman, sadly, uh, in the war, and I forget which period of time, was suffering from tetanus to the point where he couldn't do anything about changing the position of his body. He was stuck in that position as a result of a tetanus bacterial infection, okay? So a tetanus, a bacterial infection is, is a severe, it can cause severe contraction of the musculature. And back then they didn't have the ability to cure that and uh, it's a very bad thing. Right? So tetanus shots, really important to help protect us, right, from developing a tetanus type reaction. Have you ever heard the term lockjaw? So this is like a tetanus where, where you've got a contraction of the jaw and it's not going to allow your, your jaw to open to, to actually, so to eat and drink, if your jaw is closed, right, that's a problem. Right? So let's go, let's move back to where we were before. So you'll see here that we have these two terms. We've talked about them multiple times. So now you have a better idea as far as what's going on with an isotonic and an isometric contraction. So you'll see here that in B, it says isometric contraction. So we're lifting the load, we're, we're holding on to the weight, onto the load. So Lift your book, like anybody, you have like something that's a little bit of a weight. Lift it, don't lift it, just hold it over the tabletop. And do you feel like your musculature, so it's not, it's not, you're not shortening it, but you're, you can feel that it's tight, right? It's tight. That's an isometric contraction. The isotonic contraction is when you not only have that load on the weight, but then you actually shorten the musculature, you slide actin upon myosin, and you end up having movement of the skeleton as a result of that isotonic contraction, okay? So not just the abdominal muscles, but here you see as far as uh, biceps, okay? And then triceps, releasing it, letting it go down. The reason why I like in working out with weights um, working out with free weights is because when you're working out with a free weight, it's working the antagonistic muscles, is it not? Because you're working one group of muscles to do one action, and then when you release the muscle, release the, you know, when you're doing the opposite action, right, to let the muscle, the uh, weight go down, you're still working the other opposing antagonistic muscle. So, yeah, good stuff, free weights. Muscle fatigue and recovery. I'll hit this and then we'll take a, a quick five minute and then we'll finish up the rest of the PowerPoint, okay? So look at this here, muscle fatigue and recovery. So oxygen debt contributes to muscle fatigue. And so when you're working, when you're doing some type of physical activity, right? You can, you're, you're continually using up the resources that are available as far as your oxygen, as far as any type of ATP that's present. And, and also calcium levels also, right? So there's a lot of things going on that are incorporated into the action of contracting a muscle and allowing it to do its action and to do some work, okay? So calcium leaks out of the SR, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and can, can also be a factor. And then you have these tired muscles. 
where after working, after becoming fatigued, they can't generate the force that they could. You've all like lifted something, and if you've worked out with weights or something like that, and and you you know you do a couple sets of of exercises, so you're doing repetitions, and you're doing sets of repetitions. So I do eight, then I do another eight, then I do another eight, and three to four sets of repetitions. After at that fourth set, and you're doing like four, five, like. Right? Doesn't it get, it's like tiring and such. And so as a result of, those muscles can become fatigued, they can become tired. Um, interesting, regular weightlifting promotes rapid recovery. So when you first start out, so I've done this over the years too, that, you know, I'm 57, right? And so you, you have gaps in like your training. And so when there's a gap in your training, of muscle training, exercising and such, when you start back into it again, <laughs> Oh, gosh, help me. You know, it's terrible, right? Because, you know, like, you know that you have to do it, and you're doing it, but it's really hard, and you get tired quickly, and fatigue, and you're in pain, and there's a lot of things that go on with, you know, resuming uh, an exercise program. And so, after you do it for a period of time, though, on a regular basis, there's a regular um, rapid recovery that's promoted after you doing your your exercising let's see here yeah so we only have we have like seven more slides give me a five minute so give me five minutes folks online we're still recording here on campus five minutes want to get a drink step out for just a moment five minutes and then we'll come back and finish up these slides for today okay so folks online, I'm going to shut off the microphone. It's still recording. Five minutes.
Okay, folks, very good. So we are going to finish up what's going on as far as in this chapter here for you all on on in the classroom. So let's move on. So muscle injuries. So really good to remember that I said to you that if we have an overstretching of muscle and tendon, we call that a strain, S-T-R-A-I-N-S, or strains. Strain, no S, strain, multiple. Um, and it's overstretching of the muscle fibers, overstretching of the soft tissue of the tendons and such. This can be mild, moderate, or severe, depending upon how much damage is taken, has taken place. Okay? Um, you'll see here the term RICE, R-I-C-E. That stands for rest, ice, compression, elevation. Let's write that down. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. So very important that this is what you should keep in mind when you have some type of overstretching and this can also apply to springs okay rest ice compression elevation so rest don't use the joint right so don't use that area that you damaged don't use it ice ice is an anti-inflammatory so ice will really help with the compression with with what's going on as far as the inflammatory process okay so it'll help with the pain and discomfort. It'll help with the inflammation. Compression will help with the swelling that takes place. So there's always swelling where we would say the proper term is edema, edema. And this swelling can take place. Short term, not a problem, but long term, it's a problem. So compression, having a bandage that you wrap around the area that's been injured, that's a, that could be helpful. E for elevation. Meaning that, so say I sprain my ankle or I strain the musculature of my lower leg, right? Wouldn't it be a good idea to elevate it, my lower leg greater than my uh, heart, so that this way we're not contributing to the swelling? Have you ever done a done a job on your finger, on one of your fingers or your or wrist, and you actually try and like hold it up or have like prop up some pillows and allow for it to be elevated so that it'll not get all swollen. If you were to just let it rest on the side of your body, it could actually get more swollen, more edematous, more swelling taking place. So elevation, a good thing. Tears. So know that with these strains and sprains that can occur, there can be minor, moderate, or even major tearing taking place in addition to this overstretching of the soft tissue. That's all a tear is just an overstretching. Well, it can, you know, as a result, we can, you know, or as a result of some other type of injury that caused the tear. So it's not only just that, but that can be a fact. You'll see here also that scar tissue may shorten muscle. So when muscle um, heals and if it's been damaged, it's been severely damaged, it can not, re what will happen is that the body would not replace the damaged muscle with muscle tissue, but with scar tissue. And this can be a problem. And this can really affect the function of the musculature or of the tendons, ligaments, and such. Cramping, spasms, ticks, right? These are all common musculoskeletal type of issues that can occur. Uh, many times you'll see here cramping. Have you ever laid in bed and you've gotten a cramp at all? Oh, it's not good, right? It's not a good, yeah, it's not a good feeling, right? It's terrible. And, and, you know, it's not like you're going, oh, let's see how hard I can contract this muscle. No, it's like it's your body's doing that to you. And you're like, ah, you know, it's, it's not a good feeling. You know? um, so, so trying to, like, um, really do all that you can to put pressure on the muscle that's contracting, that can sometimes help a little bit to ease it. Um, and, and really, so many times it's, it's some kind of, um, imbalance that's going on that's causing it. Some type of nutritional supplementation, a, a deficiency of an ion like potassium, this can be a factor. A spasm can occur also. So 
if you've ever injured it, if you, have you ever had a, um, been involved in a car accident, maybe had a whiplash injury, the musculature of your neck and shoulders or your low back can get really uh, severely damaged to the point where you have spasms, where you, you can just be walking along and all of a sudden zing, and you just feel like, oh, that really, and it kind of contracts for a short period of time, or it contracts for extended period of time, and it's not a good feeling. A tick is something that a person many cannot control. So have you ever seen someone have what we call a, a nervous tick, right? These these actions where they're they're they they're doing some type of action, they're not trying to consciously do that. It's something going on within their neurological system, and and there are different disorders that can contribute and have presentations of these ticks. Right? What about like the sleep? Yeah, so a restless leg that can also be as a result of deficiencies and such, or overuse. Yeah, so or, or overuse, so like trained really hard. And so, like at night, like I'll take this supplement called uh, Calm, and it's a magnesium supplement, and that helps to, like with the restless leg type thing if you have that at night. It also helps good for cardiovascular. So Here's another one, muscular dystrophy. So Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is the, one of the more common, most common types of muscular dystrophy. Um, it, it, this is a, a disorder, it's a genetic disorder that leads to a progressive destruction of musculature. So whereas a young person might have began life and could do normal activities, over time they could progressively regress and get worse as far as their inability to do certain types of activities or even take care of themselves. And they could be uh, stuck in some type of uh, wheelchair, ambulatory device. Um, it's sad stuff, it's really quite sad. And, and know that there's research out there that has helped patients with this and that um, allowing for a longer life expectancy and such uh, and, a, and a healthier, more active life, but uh, still, still they're doing different research and trying to help regarding manipulate genes and such in order to uh, prevent progressive or slow the progression of this uh, illness. It's a terrible illness. Bacterial infection, so tetanus is the one that we talked about earlier there, right? So if it's a bacterium, we should be able to have some type of antibiotic unless it's antibiotic resistance, resistant. You know that that can be a problem. That's a real thing. But it's affecting, look at that, it's interfering with the nervous system signals to the muscle. So it's really preventing, and this can be also toxins from, uh, from snakes or from other types of creatures, like uh, I'm thinking of, uh, yeah, and also so insects and, and those kind of creatures and spiders. As well as um, what's like the large reptile, I'm thinking of like an iguana or something, where the they, they, big ones can really have like they secrete a toxin in their mouth that can also affect ability for you know muscle muscle. Say again. Yeah, there you go. Right? Don't they have like poisons and such? And so is it the bacteria more than it's the poison? Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that's very right. good. Thank you for the input. Yeah, so, but I know that other, like, you know, snakes in particular, neurotoxin, it's called. So, neurotoxins can affect the nervous system and how it functions and can cause paralysis. Here's the deal, folks. If it's paralysis of the musculature that allows you to breathe, that, that's a problem, right? <laughs> Absolutely, that's a problem that can cause death. Cancer. Not so common in the muscular system, you have to tell you that, right? So um, relatively uncommon, 1% of new cancer cases each year. So, you know, that's at least one area of the body that's really not susceptible so much to uh, cancer type activity as well as other areas are. Why do you think that is? You know, I would tell you that one reason why that would be is when we think of areas where there's rapidly dividing cells, so think the skin, right, and, and the digestive tract, um, so like colon cancer and stuff, these are areas that are more common because 
um, these, these they're continually renewing new cells. So the more that you have a process going on, there's more of the risk of problems going on in that process and mutations and different issues going on. Yeah. There's not that much uh, cell, cell multiplication going on with possible. Yeah, it's different, right? Yeah, because really remember also that you're, you're, when you're building muscle, it's a result of exercising or, or growth for a child into an adult. But once you become an adult, I mean, it's just a matter of that, you know, you have to exercise, do activity in order to increase. And you're not really increasing the muscle cells. So notice, folks, you're not increasing the muscle cells, the muscle fibers. You're increasing the size of those fibers, but you're not increasing the number of fibers. Interesting, right? So you would think that, oh, you know, if I've got these bigger muscles, I've got more muscle fibers, more muscle cells. That's not the case. It's more the guts of what's inside of the muscle fibers, right? That's what's expanding and growing. There is some branching that's taking place because as a result of physical training, you know, but not so, it's really it's not increasing the muscle fiber number, but increasing the size of those muscle fibers. We'll see that in a moment. We saw that already. Okay, so physical activity, right? So when we think of muscles, this is a, a very common thing that we're thinking of as far as, well, hey, you know, thinking about exercise and thinking about what, how we can affect the quality and how the activity level of the muscles that we have in particular skeletal, but also in smooth muscle also too, by having, by improving our cardiovascular health by exercising and training, we are affecting smooth muscle and in, in, indirectly, right? As well as, and the cardiac muscle, as well as then the skeletal muscle. So all the muscles are improving as a result of physical activity. So we know what aerobic exercise will do. We know what strength training will do. But again, like I said, it doesn't increase the number of fibers, it increases the size of the fibers. See here, so we know that movement is a big part of what the muscular system does. Remember, I mentioned this to you that as a result of exercise and activity levels, we're increasing the heat that we're producing, right? So we're endotherm. So we, as we exercise, we improve, increase and add to the heat within our body. Again, you know, what they talk about 98.6 Fahrenheit, it's lower than that right now, but that's what they, they talk about as far as we hear average body temp. And um, know that it's as a result of movement and exercise and contraction of skeletal muscle. How about smooth muscle moving food? How about cardiac mus muscle, again, moving blood as a result of those pumps? And a review. Very good. All right, folks, so let me say goodbye to our, uh, stop recording and say goodbye to our online class. So class, I'm gonna stop recording.